Welcome, everybody. It's Dr. Doug Pernikoff of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. And, of course, I want to introduce my wonderful co-host, Cindy Vickers, who's our trainer and animal expert in many divisions. And today we have a very, very special guest. He's a longtime friend of mine, uh, a man, a veterinarian of great experience. I call him a vet extraordinaire. Uh, and his name is Marty Greenwell. Marty uh, will tell us a lot about what his background is, but basically... Uh, he has been uh, one of these guys that can work with any kind of species. In particular, he's had a lot of experience with the uh, lower vertebrates, I'll call them, the fishes and the, um, all the reptiles and amphibians, but I'm going to let him expand on that a little bit. So, uh, Marty, why don't you say hi to the group? Hi, everybody. Uh, that was Marty. Isn't he good? He's so well trained. Marty, can you just give us a, a, a short list of your history as, as you remember it? Because we're getting older, it's hard to remember some of that stuff. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, I was born and raised in St. Louis, grew up uh, in Florissant, went to Chaminade for high school, uh, did my undergrad at WashU, and then uh, my veterinary degree at the uh, University of Missouri. Um, my parents uh, would have told you that uh, I have a lifelong passion for creepy crawlies, uh -huh. which uh, of course means um, insects and amphibians and reptiles and, uh, and fish. So I probably got my first fish aquarium when I was six years old for uh -huh. my sixth birthday. Oh, wow. I want to jump in real quick. When our kids were little, they had each they had separate bedrooms but we were trying to figure out a way to kind of comfort them at night so i put in freshwater aquariums in each room and i thought it was the ideal setting because there's a little night light there's activity they have relationships with the fishes and as long as they don't swim with the fishes but <laughs> but overall i thought it was like a really creative idea and the kids loved it have you ever heard of anything like that or oh yeah you know i, I I've noticed in a lot of um, doctors' office, mm -hmm. uh, pediatricians, many different doctors keep aquariums, and um, I think also the assisted living facilities do that for the same reason. It's kind of a passive entertainment. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, very good. It relaxes and, and your patients and gets their mind off their problems. Now, rumor has it that you actually uh, trained with an amazing zoo veterinarian when he was in his residency. Can you tell us a, a short note about that? Yes, the uh, zoo veterinarian in question would be Dr. Doug Pernick. Oh, my word, I know him. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, when I was still in vet school, <clears throat> winter of 86, I did a two-month preceptorship at the St. Louis Zoo, and Doug was the resident there at the time, and... Uh, you know, he's always been a source of encouragement and enthusiasm and support. So it's a pretty well, long friendship. Where do I send the check, Marty? Oh, I'll you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for those comments. It's always fun. And yeah, you're right. Our, our friendship started there and it's just kind of grown over time. So if you, um, Marty, when you were at the zoo, were you working with fish or amphibians at the zoo or is that just pre-fish pre, pre, pre -fish days? Um, most of my fish experience actually was, uh, you know, self-directed. Um, as a hobbyist, I kept fish from a young age up until, actually until college. Um, until the fish went to college? Or, oh no, you, I get you. Okay, Until ahead. I was in college, correct, yeah. No, there was not, you know, and I did an internship in zoo and wildlife medicine at the uh, Riverbank Zoo in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, they had recently completed a major exhibit called the Aquarium Reptile Complex. And there were all the usual startup problems with a major aquatic exhibit. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I got a baptism by fire that way. But uh, most of my fish experience was through, through my own self-study and my own interest. Hmm. Very cool. So, um, can I sort of jump right in here? Yeah, I bet. Um, there's, there's some things I want to know about fish, but even more, I think that you also have some experience with um, marine mammals. Am I, am I on the right track here? Oh, you're jumping ahead, but that's cool. Should, should I not jump ahead? Should no, that's stick fine. To the fish? That's fine. I mean, he hasn't talked to us a little bit about more about the shed experience. Okay, you got. No, I, no, go ahead. Go ahead with your question. Well, 
Okay, I'll start with the easy question. I'll, then I'll get to the one that I'm really, really interested sure. in. Sure. Um, and here it is. Do fish feel pain? Yes, they do. Okay, so that you have any thoughts about fishing and hooking a fish with, you know, with a <laughs> fishing hook and then ripping it out of their body and throwing them back in? I know that they survive it, but are you suggesting that this is a uh, issue for you or? it is a bit it is a bit of an issue <laughs> yes my little grandson got his first fishing pole and he caught three fish and i mean i'm not saying i'm anti-fishing but i can't even there's Fathom. no way i could do it yeah you know i can't well i guess i'm going to lead you into that answer um sure uh, but basically our role as veterinarians is to care for critters so we're not designed. <laughs> not to hook them. We're not to hook them, right? So although we may personally be interested in hooking them, um, I always tell people, you know, my role is to be a facilitator and support. How do you feel about that? You know? Yeah, I would agree. I, uh, you know, I'm not uh, a fisherman. Never have been really a fisherman. Um, you know, I took my son fishing when he was little as part of the uh, rite of passage of being mm -hmm. an American boy. But uh, Did you bring him home? I sure did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he loved it. But, you know, we, re we released everything we caught. Yeah, yeah, with scars. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. So, again, I started to uh, ask you, you know, what drives a person to be passionate about these other special animals? And, of course, I'm of the same seed and uh, have, have had a similar experience as a child growing up with interest. But what, what do you remember about, what was the interest in drive? I know you're a very intellectual person, so behind there, was that what was driving your questions or your interest? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that the one thing about um, animals that has always sort of really grabbed me is the variety and the diversity of of life on earth and um when i was young my older brother worked at belts aquarium in mm -hmm. hazelwood which mm -hmm. was a, a iconic big, facility yeah very big wholesale retail tropical fish business and he would take me behind the scenes into the hatchery and the diversity of the fish was just astounding it mm -hmm. was you know i mean just astounding and uh in fact, I mean, there are more species of fish than there are all other vertebrates combined. Wow. So that means more fish species than mammals, birds, reptiles, and the amphibians. Wow. And, of course, you know, as I got older and I was reading more natural history, you know, you learn how all these, this amazing variety of, of fishes have unique and special adaptations for their own lifestyle and their own niches in nature um, i call that form and function and i love it too it's an area that drove me for the same reasons i i would look at my classmates at vet school and one guy was strictly into cows or this and that and that was great i loved all the animals but i like you would sit there and go i'm here because of the biodiversity i love to look at a critter and understand how they're built to live in a specific ecological niche or space in life absolutely doug yeah. yeah that's kind of the that's our mutual i think oh yeah regards. very much we share a conservation ethic yeah and you can bring that down even cindy to the dog level or the specific group of animals and say each one i mean throughout the dog breeds we know that they're all designed and engineered over life and evolution to become what they are today and for different functions or different purposes right well you know going back to the fish when you're talking about having that many fish where this where when you combine all of the vertebrates and the fish outnumber all of them combined then i'm wondering how do you make a decision and can you make the decision of what do you study because uh, clearly you can't know about all of them so how what is the need you know for veterinary why do we medicine? have these well why do we have these facilities you know aquariums why are public aquariums so popular or why are they so necessary that's a, a good question, don't you think? Well, I, yeah. Are they necessary? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah. Obviously, you know, I'm going to be pro public aquarium. Um, I think to get people to care about marine life or aquatic life, it starts with inspiring them. And I don't think, 
I mean, sure, you can be inspired by, you know, television shows, Nat, Nat Geo, Discovery, whatever. But to actually see, you know, a living, breathing fish and the diversity of colors and forms and behaviors, I mean, it's just astounding. And it's, it's great, especially to watch children, their, their jaw drops when the first time they see a you know, a shark or a, a... Right next to get to the glass. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Think, yeah. Well, so. I think that's the same concept for any uh, museum or um, uh, zoo or whatever. Uh, it, it's a chance to get people that will never have an opportunity or likely never have an opportunity to see an animal in the wild in their natural perspective. And it's a first step, Like I agree with you, it's a first step for education. If you go to zoos and museums and stuff, Part of it is passive education by just viewing the setup, how the animals are interacting, you know, uh, the, and then you've got some that are graphics that teach you if you read and you're willing to read. So there's a whole complement, and then they have education programs built in, whole complement of ways to use those resources and make them impactful. And uh, the other nice thing about granting, um, and I don't agree with everything about zoos and everything about captive management, but Overall, if it's understood as a means to get the massive populace aware of the issues that are impending on, on you know, our environment and our animals, then I think that there's a, a reasonable value to there. And I understand what you're saying, but I think it'd be um, important to know that is it, does it work? I mean, are people developing enough of a, an interest that they care? that they would say, I want to do something that would um, preserve the life of these animals, essentially that would be going, getting extinct, all right, because of our behavior. Right. And does it make a difference? I, I wonder if there's any way well, to measure that. I, you know, I th again, maybe I should let you speak, but you know, I grew up with Wild Kingdom and Marlon Perkins, and you know, even if it drew a dozen people to be effective in per providing some service on behalf of the the biological world that way like veterinarians that's just one category mm -hmm. uh, then there must be value and then how many people the, all these campaign drives most of those people aren't intimately involved in these kind of uh, actions but they're familiar and there's a warm spot uh, thinking about the elephant at the circus even though we now circuses aren't so well applauded but you know i grew up with those things and though i couldn't wait for the opportunity to see a live elephant or a live gorilla or whatever and it kept stimulating me so i think that even people that don't have the level of stimulation i still think that they are aware to some degree and then hopefully when they see a campaign that's relevant then they know how to respond i don't know i hope yeah i think that <clears throat> you know education from whether you're talking about zoos, botanical gardens, or uh, museums, or public aquaria, you know, they sort of offer a menu as far as how deep do you want to um, explore this topic. Mm -hmm. And what Doug was talking about with passive education, where you're just there to, to look and, you know, maybe glance at some graphics, but you'd be amazed at the number of people that you really pull in to either take a course, go to a seminar, you know, and I know that- Buy a book. Buy a book, exactly. Yeah. Uh, certain institutions like Malshed Aquarium and the Missouri Botanical Gardens also offered college level courses oh. that you could take. So, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's sort of a menu there and it's right. not forcing someone to to care, but I, you do draw people into that process. And we're always looking to get the young kids because uh, we yeah. want that generation to be more sensitive. But what's more exciting than going up to an aquarium and you see activity, color, flashing reflective light, uh, and then diversity of the variations that you see and the beauty of the animals. I think all that is what we need to show people in those settings. So, okay, so another question. Do, do fish form the kind of communities that, like the, the marine mammals do, you know, like the sharks and the whales? Communities within their own groups or, or communities of human interest? Within their own groups. Okay. Um, I tell you what, that's yeah. a good question. Yes. 
And I'm thinking we're going to be coming close to a break, so why don't we wait to come back? And if that works for you all, then we can kind of elaborate at that time rather than have you start. Does that sound good? Oh, it sounds great. Oh, does it sound really good? Mm -hmm. Okay, so everybody, we'll be back in just a moment. Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show with our special guest, Dr. Marty Greenwell, and, of course, Dr. Doug, myself, and Cindy Vickers. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back, everybody. It's Dr. Doug Pernikoff again, and we're here. We're picking up where we left off discussing marine biology and veterinary medicine with Dr. Marty Greenwell. And Cindy, uh, you had a question. You I do have a question, but before I ask that question, do we want to give just a tiny little bit of information about some of the um, really great street cred that Marty has? The what? Street cred. Street cred. Oh, yeah, yeah. Credentials. Sure. Oh, yeah, wow. absolutely. I thought you said <laughs> street crud, and I thought, oh, I that's kind of rude. street cred. <laughs> Marty, yeah, that sounds great. Go for it. Well, um, after I graduated from vet school, I did an internship in zoo and wildlife medicine, and then I was hired by the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, and I was there for um, 12 years. Uh, the last six years, I was the director of the veterinary services program at the Shed Aquarium. It's wonderful. Yeah, we kind of all and heard of the Shed Aquarium. Yeah, so, it's impressive. Yeah, that, that's big street cred. Yeah, the crud? Cred. Cred, okay. I'm okay, not, here's. I'm not a millennial. I don't get that. Here's, I'm not either. Here's it's talk. It's not that. That's old talk. But in any case, my question was I'm, I'm really interested in uh, marine mammals. But I'm wondering, and I know that they form families that are incredibly deep and emotional, and there's a great deal of um, uh, camaraderie. Camaraderie is not even the right word. I mean, they're incredibly devoted to one another. But do fish that are in, that are um, not mammals, do they form communities like that? Or do they, I know there's such a thing as a school of fish, but do they form families at all? Do they seem to be in any way connected to one another? Uh, energetically or emotionally or in any kind of way that so you know of. I guess if what you're asking is if we see a school of fish which is characteristic of what we see in the National Geographic or something like that these schools of fish do they stay together for a lifetime or are they constantly splitting and reconnecting well them? that's really not what I'm asking but that's okay there's oh. two questions there. <laughs> <laughs> she's worse than my mother <laughs> but go ahead <laughs> Well, that's there's there's a lot of information there. Um, let's just take marine mammals, um, specific, specifically uh, the cetaceans, whales and dolphins. Um, you know, the killer whales live. The ones that live that are coastal dwellers live in age graded maternal hierarchies, um, and there is fidelity of daughters, granddaughters, and the young uh, sons and grandsons to that group. Um, and that group stays together uh, more or less permanently as, as long as the resources to support them as far as food are present. Um, Do the male, young males get kicked out at some point? Right, right, but right around the time of puberty or shortly thereafter, there they go join bachelor groups. Oh, okay. um, and uh, so, but you know, there's in truth not a whole lot of marine mammal species or cetacean species have been studied for as long or as much detail as killer whales or bottlenose dolphins. Um, we know that for most whales and dolphins, there's definitely a strong bond between the mother and the calf. But how many species actually have these long-term uh, hierarchies where there's, you know, genetic fidelity is, mm -hmm. is really unknown. Mm -hmm. um, now, does that sort of thing occur in fish? Not, no, I don't, not to my knowledge. That's not to say that fish cannot work together. 
sort of cooperate for hunting, for you know going after predators. And in fact, it has been well documented that say groupers in this was happening in the Red Sea and in the Indian Ocean would recruit moray eels uh, through uh, body language and they would hunt together. The moray eels Uh-oh. could get through the cracks and crevices and the grouper was monitoring the, the more open water. So so they would flush out, um, the, the eels would flush out hiding fish maybe on behalf of the other? That's correct, yes. Wow. yes. Very cool. Uh, there's a, a species of marine fish called a goat fish and they hunt in groups and some of the goat fish uh, will chase the prey and others will head them off and block them uh, like a group of lions or, mm-hmm. or African wild dogs. Mm-hmm. So there is that sort of cooperation for sure. Um, is, is, it, is there any, uh, is it known how they communicate with one another? Um, in some instances, yes. Uh, in a lot of instances, it's not real clear. It's an electrical impulse or um, waveform in the water? I think a lot of it is body language, posturing. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of body language that, that mm-hmm. we're slowly sort of starting to figure out. You know, mm-hmm. like you could, you could tell when a shark is, is getting aggravated and is likely to try to bite you know mm-hmm. just by that they lower their fins and they mm-hmm. drop their heads and that's the sign i did the same thing get out of there yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you've seen me bite yes before. yes <laughs> it's what dogs do yeah they you know, do you're right so i always find it interesting <laughs> when you look at um uh, behaviors like that that we kind of grow up thinking are strictly mammalian so i i compare this uh concept to uh, that you're talking about my tarantulas act very because they're high-end carnivore essentially yeah so i like to compare and i see a lot of their behaviors in in their world remind me of mammalian activity of a high order uh, mammalian uh, predator and uh, that can be social in their breeding or in their the way they they uh, trap and attack and, and eat the animal and stuff like that so uh, that's what you're describing here is that we get we're so fixed on what we do as mammals and high-end mammals, but we forget that a lot of those principal behaviors and physiology and stuff still can be expressed in smaller and lesser species. Well, I think if people uh, find a way to relate somehow to the animals of interest, and and what you're saying is that you want them to be in captivity to some to some extent so that people have a chance to be educated about them and also to some way identify in a way that would make them care enough to mm-hmm. protect them right okay mm-hmm. essentially so if if you know it's if it's somehow relatable like even the fish have this way of reading each other's body language and uh cooperating with one another for to reach an end goal like people can understand that and right. and for i think a lot of people they need something that they can understand that in some way relates, relates. to them yeah Good so point. i mean that that would be you know that's just part of the education uh hopefully yeah, I think I yeah. mentioned that uh, when I practiced veterinary medicine, I always felt like the more uh, my teaching or encouragement to do certain things is kind of familiar to people with how they've been managed medically, it's easier to sell a service or to explain why you have to do something mm-hmm. and spend money here. So that's kind of the same principle. You know, we mm-hmm. do, we're more attracted to something we're familiar with. And at the same time, we're more attracted in some cases to the diversity, the changes, the differences. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And you were already talking some really interesting stories. I could listen to you all day just to talk about the different types of species, even within one large group like fishes, and how they've all developed and evolved to fit one state, one one way of living. And uh, you talked about partnerships between the moray and you know, there's all those terms like commensalism and, you know, all those things that describe relationships between species and individual animals. Okay, so here's a, like, if you're the veterinarian, what do do they need the veterinarian for? I mean, do they get like, you know, a rabies shot? (laughs) It is to protect them against bacteria? And does other, I mean, are there problems, and, and are there problems in captivity 
that a veterinarian needs to address that they would not need to address. Well, I just want to set up that a little bit for you, and you'll probably answer this, but what I find most interesting about what you do or what you've done at the Shedd Aquarium, in mammalian medicine, we're, we have one system, air, we're familiar, we know and everything, but here it's not only the animal, but more importantly, you've got fresh water, brackish water, salt water, you've got these environments that these animals are trapped in, and if they're so critical that if there's minor changes in the chemistry or the whatever, then you've got disease that can be imposed upon. That's unique to anything that veterinarians have to do. You go ahead from there. Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, I, you know, sort of square one um, for fish health management or you know, successful um, keeping of fish, whether it's a hobby or a profession, um, is to be very careful with the water quality, measuring certain chemical parameters and physical parameters and testing them in some cases on a daily or twice daily basis to make sure that they're right where they should be. Uh, some organisms are very sensitive to water quality, like the marine invertebrates, the corals. Uh, sharks are very touchy about water quality, but yeah. Do technologies exist now, I assume, that are almost like uh, monitors for change? So do you have the, the aquariums, let's say, do they have kind of um, technological devices in, in the water that are always measuring for those changes? Like, like the person in the ICU, the nurse stays at the station, but she's got all the patient's parameters showing in front of her. Do they have that kind of sensitivity in their management yet? There are a lot of uh, water quality monitors, electronic devices that you can get even as a hobbyist. I'm not aware of any sort of like, uh, you know, like a central unit that's perhaps linked to a computer mm -hmm. that would monitor the all these parameters in a large facility like a public aquarium. Because you'd think that would be the obvious, and I know that technology exists oh, for, yeah, well, it, for other applications. It is technically possible. There's, there's no question about it. And some of those things are monitored electronically. Oh, that's cool. Well, we're just getting ready for one more break, and I just want to thank you, Marty. So far, it's been really interesting. And we'll be back with Cindy. Doug and Marty in just a moment. Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. See you in just a moment. Welcome back. It's segment three of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, and we've had a really interesting discussion. We're going to continue on with our guest, Dr. Marty Greenwell, who's talking to us about his history right now at the Shedd Aquarium and all the interesting things he's done there. Uh, so this thing with the sea mammals, I know from my own experience in the zoo world, it's heavily regulated. The entire world watches you. If one animal dies, you're the bad guy. And um, I just wonder, because I, I kind of had that experience with other species. Um, it's kind of scary, and yet you know, the expert is the guy who did it one more time before you. But how did you guys support that responsibility, not only within your own facility, but across other like facilities like SeaWorld and stuff like that? Sure. Um, well, there there is a uh, International Association for Aquatic Animal Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, they have annual conferences with presentations of papers and posters, um, just like other professional groups so there's a large collegiate element to it mm -hmm. um, we're always on the phone with colleagues discussing cases situations um, we have consultants that are retained that have extensive experience with marine mammals or certain fish or what have you mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of uh, collegiate interaction between uh, veterinarians and uh, aquarium professionals that are responsible for the life support and the maintenance of these the marine mammals. Do you have like um, periodic uh, hands-on? Do you have to do an annual exam that requires constraining the animal or sedating the animal? Or are those things pretty limited? No, oh no, yeah, no. That Every facility is a little different. Um, actual 
restraining them, um, doing a complete physical, getting blood work done and everything was done twice annually. But on a monthly basis, you know, all the dolphins and the beluga whales at the shed, they, they were trained to present their flukes uh -huh. um, and they allowed us to voluntarily get blood samples. Did they learn that opportunity as a fluke or was it <laughs> was it determined? They were trained. No, they were trained to do that. And then, of course, they're rewarded with uh, lots of fish and lots of hugs and praise. But yeah. So how do you how do you measure the um, uh, the mammal nature of uh, sea mammals or water mammals? relative to what we think about in primates the the intellectual ability or we always talk about the intelligence of elephants and things like this where do they fit they're right up there you know um there's a a book written by a man named carl safina called beyond words mm -hmm. and it's about intelligence and communication and animals and we know that great apes elephants Dolphins and whales, uh, wolves have uh, a higher order of cognitive function. Mm -hmm. They can like recognize themselves in the mirror. Mm -hmm. um, they have intentionality where they cooperate with with their their mates or their their uh, sisters or brothers or what have you to either hunt or to complete a task that requires cooperation between two or three people. Of course. Great apes also, at least in the case of chimps, use tools. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that's yeah they're 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 a higher order cognitively than I think uh, the rest of, of of the animal world. And, well, I guess that's your great advantage to serving them is that at least you have the ability, like you said, to train them to present so you can draw a blood sample or you can give a shot or whatever you need to do. Yeah, with. You know, with cetaceans, you have to focus constantly on keeping them mentally stimulated, keeping them active. They have, you know, at the shed, more toys than a Toys R Us store. <laughs> um, there were always non-structured versus structured interaction with the, the marine mammal trainers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, there, there's a real effort for behavioral enrichment. Right, right. I was going to say enrichment. And that became really interesting and in, um, a motivating uh, science when I was still in the zoo world. So it's not a very old um, concept to try and be enriching for these animals and to not only to give them a physical environment, but also to provide opportunity within that environment to to interact and do all these things you're describing there is a neuroscientist Lori Marino um, I don't know what your thoughts are her but she says that the um, the killer whales have a part of the brain that humans don't have and it causes them to have a highly elaborate emotional life when they're very very social so they um, you know, they're very, it seems like their family, they're very devoted to, to their families. And you saw, like, if you saw the documentary Blackfish, how they, when you separating the mother from the babies from the mother, they literally produce sounds that the trainers had never heard before. And they just literally screamed in a corner and would mm -hmm. move for 24 solid hours. And it changed their behavior mm -hmm. dramatically. And, and how the, and how they say that their their family is unique. You can't take one um, of these killer whales and put them in just with others because it's not their family. It says it's like different species. I don't know how you feel about this, doctors, but I'm just saying what I saw in the documentary. Well, yeah. And and then also putting them in an environment where they're used to swimming a hundred miles a day, and right, then they're right. in a little or go in a big territory. Well, elephants are kind of the same way. Um, you know, we most of the elephants that came into the zoo world and the in the circus world over the last 50 years came out of the wild, and they were taken as babies. Their parents were killed. They saw these actions, and then they put them into a group that's being trained aggressively. And when we came back in uh, the last couple dozen years and started trying to breed them by putting them back into social structure, it was difficult. And the zoo world used to say it takes like seven to ten years to take, let's say you took uh, elephants out of the Ringling Brothers and you were going to create a breeding group, hopefully. It takes seven to ten years for them to coalesce and really reform a community before they would even consider breeding. 
So I, I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> well, you know, I, I agree with, uh, with the conclusions of that neuroscientist. And I think it's uh, particularly cruel to separate uh, a mother and a calf. Um, I think it's cruel to take an animal out of a, like the maternal hierarchy of an elephant group. You know, that the, the, the matriarch has a memory for where the watering places are during droughts, for mm-hmm. where food sources are during famine or drought. Good and point. Um, yeah. you disrupt that, you know, that, that group by, you know, either killing the matriarch or separating them or you just disrupt it and, and you're impacting the survival of the whole group of elephants mm-hmm. or killer whales or whatever have you that has that kind of sophisticated social structure. Um, Are these whale rides where you go to visit rail, uh, people? Some people say it's disruptive. When I, I did go on one of these years ago with my family and I thought it was great and it seemed like the whales were following us. I got to see a, a feeding pod come up and all kinds of neat stuff. They didn't seem disrupted by us in our boat, but... Oh, you're talking about the whale watching. Whale watching. watching Is that a bad thing? Um, Not in my experience, not my knowledge. Uh, Most most people that do that are very careful about keeping a certain distance from the animals, not interacting with them by either touching or feeding them. Mm -hmm. It's it's strictly passive observation. Now, there are people that break the rules, but... um, you know that's I mean, it's illegal and mm-hmm. uh, and it's um, very much frowned upon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, whale watching to me is a passive and uh, not a damaging um, form of observing nature. But whales in Sea World, for instance, that's being uh, that's gone or it's on the way out. Yeah, uh, are you okay with that? I mean, because I don't know how you could possibly keep an animal that size in enough space to make them socially and emotionally comfortable. Well, that's just it, Doug. Um, You know, the first year that I started at the aquarium, I was on a uh, collecting trip at the Shedd Aquarium in the Caribbean and one of the... uh, uh, Show off. (laughs) (laughs) How hard for you. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it's it's rough. Um, the, uh, The captain of the boat had been a marine mammal trainer and worked with killer whales and you know, we had a very frank conversation, and the issue is that they're too big. Hmm. They really, you cannot provide enough space for a natural group of killer whales. Sure. You know, they're just too big. And I think, you know, you encounter a similar situation with elephants. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know that they tend to get chronic foot problems right. because of the restricted space they're in. Well, in the wild, they normally. Uh, trek you know thousands of miles in a season in a year and we take that opportunity away from them yes exactly uh, part of that's because they're looking for resources but at the same time we're disrupting something very significant and ingrained in their uh, their development and stuff but uh, do you have any final comments you want to make we're just about closing up and um anything you want to say would be great um yeah you know we're facing globally um a lot of depredation of our marine resources and uh, whether you accept global climate change or not um, there definitely seem to be some far-reaching um, uh, negative and neg- yeah yeah <laughs> you know the, the, the yeah the Arctic uh, ice melt mm-hmm. the uh, death of the northern third of the Great Barrier Reef due to high ocean temperatures that's it's a lot of when you, when you look at all of these things together, it's there's there should be a genuine cause for concern. I agree with you right there. We're going to break away. We'll be back with our final segment and a recap. Dr. Doug Parnikoff of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show, our wonderful guest, Dr. Martin Greenwell, and my wonderful co-host, Ms. Cindy Vickers. We'll be back in just a moment. Don't hold back. Flipper, flipper, faster than 
and lightning, no one you see is smarter than he. And we know Flip Well, we're back in our final segment. I call my recap segment. It's Dr. Doug Pernikoff, sponsored by the Clarkson Wilson Veterinary Clinic. Our number is 636 530 1808. And we sponsor also uh, Cindy Vickers in her training role. She has programs available for puppy training. She works with animals that have behavioral issues that evolve and develop or from rescue where you don't know where you're getting when you rescue an animal. We strongly support it, but it's a challenge sometimes. So she can help you there. And any other problem that comes up in training, we'd like you to give her a call at 636-530-1808 and ask for Cindy and we'll get you connected in short order. And finally, I want to thank Dr. Martin Greenwell. Again, he's had an amazing session here. We could talk for hours about his experiences and knowledge. Uh, Marty, do you want to um, say goodbye to everybody? <laughs> goodbye, everybody. Oh, he's so good do, at that. Do, do you have a favorite fish? Do I have a favorite fish? Yeah. Oh, boy. I don't mean on the dinner plate. I mean, <laughs> I don't mean that. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, you know, there's a, there's a, it's a member of the seahorse family. They're called leafy sea dragons. And uh, they're like a big seahorse, but they have all these ornate appendages that make them camouflage in with the the kelp beds and the seaweed that they inhabit and they're just I gotta look spectacular it what was it called Wait, again? leapy or leafy leafy sea dragon oh, wow. leafy sea dragon i'll look it up and find it well i want to thank you and um if you have questions about fishes and things and you can't find help call us at the clinic and we can direct you and sometimes we can even get marty to participate he's very busy and I just want to thank our audience for listening to what I thought was a good show. And tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, um, next week, we'll be coming up with another special guest. So uh, good to see you and good to talk to you all. And thank you, Marty. You're welcome.